Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 23rd, 2018, and before introducing today's guest, I want to mention that if all goes as planned, the first episode of the book club for Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, In the First Circle, will be next Monday, September 10th. My guest in that episode is Kevin McKenna, professor of Russian language, literature, and culture at the University of Vermont. And in that first episode, which we've already recorded, uh, he gives an overview of Solzhenitsyn's life, the Soviet literary scene, and Solzhenitsyn's conflict with Soviet leaders from Stalin to nearly the present. It's a fascinating conversation that I hope will be of interest, even if you're not planning to read the book. Subsequent episodes, and I don't know how many there will be yet, will go deeply into the book itself. They will be released as bonus bonus episodes and not on Mondays. Uh, those uh, will not air until at least late September, so you still have time to read the book if you'd like to follow along in real time. And we also hope to have an opportunity on Reddit for you to interact with each other about the book. Now for today's guest, philosopher, theologian, and author Yoram Hazoni. He is the president of the Herzl Institute in Jerusalem and director of the John Templeton Foundation's Project in Jewish Philosophical Theology. His latest book is The Virtue of Nationalism, which is the subject of today's episode. Yoram, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. Thank you for having me. Now, this book was a tough sell for me, uh, like many, especially those who uh, – or vaguely libertarian, classical liberal. Uh, I've become disenchanted with nationalism, uh, but I have to say your book brought me back uh, a long way uh, to take it seriously as a good idea. So it, it's an incredibly provocative read. It covers a very wide array of history, philosophy, uh, and even some current events. I want to start with the dichotomy you present at the beginning of the book, which really runs through the whole book, which is the choice between national states and an imperial order. Uh, explain what you mean by each of those. This is a um, distinction that actually we find uh, going all the way back to uh, the Bible. If you ask what is it that uh, politically is of uh, great interest to, uh, to the Israelite prophets – well, we're all familiar with it. Uh, they, they're living in a world of contending world empires. Uh, Egypt claims that it should rule the world. Babylonia claims that it should rule the world. Assyria claims that it should rule the world. And this is the, the ancient conception of um, of what the gods want. They, they want a ruler who's going to bring peace and prosperity – as we find over and over again in the ancient texts, who's going to bring peace and plenty to the world. He's going to end wars by conquering everything. And he's going to, uh, to um, cultivate, create, create, create cultivation and agriculture on a vast scale so millions can be fed. And uh, in, in, in the Bible, we, we see this very strange uh, descent that, goes almost the entire way through Hebrew scripture uh, where where the the Jewish intellectual leadership, the Israelite spiritual leadership, think that these world conquering empires are evil. They have a different proposal that they want to put on the table. They think that Israel should be an independent state ruled by a king that is from uh, from the Jewish people, with borders that uh, that the God of Israel tells the, the, the Israelites that they're not allowed to cross, and um, moreover, this this uh, vision isn't just for for Jews because we we find over and over again that that other small national states, other independent nations, are supposed to keep their independence as well. And ultimately, the vision of a peaceful world is a is a world in which nations will no longer be enslaved to these world empires. And nobody uh, seems to 
believe that um, that a small independent Israel or uh, Moab or Edom or or any of these other small countries that they're going to be uh, necessarily that they're going to bring peace and plenty to the whole world the way that those world empires claimed that they were going to. But they claim to offer something else. They claim to offer uh, freedom for these different peoples to uh, live each under its own, their own vine and their own fig tree and to understand God in their own way. Now, that's a, um, that's a long time ago that those texts were written, but uh, as it happens, Western civilization plays out almost the entire length of it as a, as a kind of a, a tension, a dialogue between the, uh, what eventually becomes the Roman Empire's vision of universal empire and Israel's vision of independent, independent nations that, uh, that uh, leave each other alone. Uh, in freedom. Let me let me bring us forward then in time to 1648 in the Treaty of Westphalia, which is one of my favorite trivia dates uh, with 1066. <laughs> I have to confess, I didn't know much about the Treaty of Westphalia. I've forgotten if I ever knew anything about it. But y- you make the case that that was an important break point in the evolution of, of the nation state and the world order that and how it was organized. So describe – how we transition out of the Roman Empire into a, what you call a Protestant version vision of of competing nation states. There had always been nations in Europe that were um, that that saw themselves define themselves in in terms of this kind of Old, Old Testament vision, but the Protestants and especially the Calvinists and the Anglicans. Uh, t- took this especially seriously. In, in 1534, we get uh, effectively uh, England's first declaration of independence. Engl- Engl- Henry VIII uh, d- doesn't just decide that he wants to make decisions about marriage. He decides that, that his kingdom is no longer under the uh, authority of uh, this vision of universal monarchy and church, which, which had been the, the, the medieval vision. It's the first, uh, it's it's the first Brexit. It's the first Brexit. In 1581, we get a declaration of independence uh, on uh, by the Dutch Protestants, which, by the way, reads an awful lot like the American Declaration of Independence. It's just 200 years earlier. Uh, and uh, then in 1648, as you say, after the Thirty Years' War, this um, English and Dutch model of uh, declared independence from uh, from the Holy Roman Empire – and from the Catholic Church, that de- model of declared independence is then adopted formally by additional nations, by uh, by by the uh, the French who are Catholics, by the Swiss, and 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 by others. So, 1648 is uh, kind of a um, a moment in which the reality uh, that had been developing for a century, in which uh, Nations declared themselves to be self de- self determining. That's a word that's invented later, obviously, but but uh, no longer uh, requiring any kind of approval, formal or theoretical, from the Holy Roman Emperor or the Pope. That that gets ratified in uh, three treaties, uh, which create for the first time an uh, a formally pluralistic order in Europe where some states are going to be Catholic, others Lutheran, others uh, Calvinist. Uh, Some are going to be monarchies and some republics. Some are going to have uh, freedoms that we would recognize, freedom of speech, limited government, and others are not going to have anything like that. And this this diversity is accepted as being uh, the the basis basis for the, the civilizational order. So, uh, so let me interrupt here because you, you say some beautiful things about that and the, the economist in me and the the Hayekian in me finds it very appealing. We have all these different countries 
they're each trying different things. They're each allowed to go their own way. They can learn from each other. They can learn from the mistakes of others. Uh, it's a, you could argue it has some of the characteristics. This is obviously a not, not accurate literally, but some of the characteristics, characteristics of federalism in the United States. Each state has a certain level of autonomy to try different things, and, and good things can be copied and bad things can be set aside. So that's the positive vision of these independent nation states choosing their own religious traditions, their own cultural traditions, their own political traditions, some good, some bad. It's obviously a very mixed bag. On the downside, which you're very aware of and write about extensively, uh, it launches a 300-year period from 1648, you could say, to 1948 of incredible warfare between all these these uh, independent nation states. So that peace and prosperity – uh, there's some prosperity, but the peace that was uh, given up by moving away from a single empire or a ton, uh, top-down sovereign, that's gone. Uh, we get an immense amount of, of colonial imperialism that's not so attractive, quite ugly in fact, as these nations vie for influence outside their immediate borders. So why is this a model that we would want to imaginably embrace and in fact – as you point out, by 1948, after the horrors of World War II, the Holocaust, which were blamed on the na nation state, perhaps incorrectly in your view, but many people view that, we now are in an era where nation, nation states are kind of embarrassing. We, the people want to move toward a more global – many people want to move toward a more global and unified uh, system of, of governance. What What's your – response to that 300-year history on the, the downside of it. You know, all sorts of people have written written about this uh, long before me, and it's an, it's an, an old argument, right? I mean, Henry Kissinger's uh, works are uh, largely uh, devoted to uh, trying to demonstrate that, uh, that the, the great conflagrations – like the, the 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 vast destructive wars during that period, um, that would be, let's say, Napoleonic wars, uh, Hitler's wars, uh, World War One. The, the, these wars are not they're not something new. They're actually very much like the Thirty Years' War, and uh, the, uh, which which was ended by the the the, the Peace of Westphalia, and. The, the way in which these uh, these huge wars uh, we can call them world wars the, 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 these universal wars are are different from wars between nation states is that uh, universal wars are devoted to some kind of an ideology of, of world domination uh, in the case of the Thirty Years War it was uh, the, the the theory of the universal Catholic order. In the case of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the, uh, the the theory of the the new universal French liberalism, uh, and and in uh, in the the two world wars, an attempt by uh, two German emperors, in effect, to try to uh, make Germany lord of the the earth, and. If, if if your system consists of uh, players who are devoted to some kind of universal vision and they are willing to uh, mobilize not just one nation but all nations uh, into kind of a universal army to go out and create that word, world order, uh, those, those seem to create uh, wars of inconceivable destruction. And the question is, what, what what does that have to do with the West, Westphalian system? Since uh, Napoleon uh, sets out to overturn and eliminate the Westphalian system, and the the Kaiser by by trying to uh, uh, destroy France and uh, and uh, to knock out France and Germany and uh, break the back of English imperial British imperial power. His goal is to destroy the Westphalian system, uh, and likewise with Hitler. So, the the first thing I would say is that uh, that the, dis, the 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 discussion about nationalism 
um, I think in order for it to be an intelligent discussion, it has to begin with the possibility that there are states in the world that have political traditions which uh, which involve uh, borders, uh, which which sanctify borders, which uh, in, in which the state says. Uh, we're only interested in governing a single people. We're not interested in conquering the whole world. And uh, the whole argument about the desirability or non-desirability of, of, of nationalism, I think it, 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 it needs to uh, be conducted around this question. If, if you're, uh, let's say today, uh, living in uh, India or uh, or Israel, or South Korea, uh, or England, or Italy, or Poland. As far as I can tell, you don't you 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 don't have aspirations for universal conquest. And the move that uh, that the globalizers wish to make uh, is they say, well. Look, it's it it it's true that these these national states uh, aren't now interested in in universal conquest, but uh, let's um, uh, change the software to a universalist software to 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 uh, uh, instead of living within borders, uh, nations are going to eliminate borders and 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 try once again to reach this kind of. Uh, universal order under a single law. Someone's and, singing, my lord, kumbaya. So we can make fun of it. <laughs> it it's a slightly, um, there seems, there's a certain naivete about it, but you don't paint it that way. You paint it as a frightening prospect. And I, partly, I think very cleverly, you call it an imperial vision, which gives it a negative sound to start with. Um, and you obviously do that Deliberately, and I think not just for marketing purposes, but also because I think you think that this global impulse is related to the, the imperialism of the past. These global visions of domination, not just I think what the, what the people who who advocate for that global order today are arguing is it's not. No, no, no. We're just gonna we're just gonna lay down our swords and and we're just gonna have a lot more plowshares, right? We're gonna have a lot more, uh, a lot fewer guns and a lot more butter. Um, I mean, is the European Union an example you talk about a lot? You say uh, after the Cold War, quote, the minds of Western leaders became preoccupied with two great imperialist projects. The European Union, which has progressively relieved member nations of many of the powers usually associated with political dependence, independence and the project of establishing an American world order in which nations that do not abide by international law might be coerced into doing so principally by means of American military might. Let's put aside the American one for a minute. I think that is complicated. But let's take the European Union. I mean, what's scary about the European Union? It's so nice, and you, get, you can travel all over Europe with one passport. It's fantastic. W what's scary about it? I don't, I, I, I'm not inherently against traveling over <laughs> Europe with one passport. I don't, I, I don't think that's the main issue. I think that the um, – Look, making it kumbaya, I think, is is making it too uh, too simplistic. The uh, the post nineteen eighty nine uh, new world order, which uh, which all American administrations have, you know, other, uh, other than the present one, I guess, have to one one extent or another believed in. Is, is not a world in which people actually lay down their their swords hmm. I mean if if uh, the, the Bushes and uh, and Bill Clinton and Obama were all about laying down their swords then we'd have an interesting discussion about whether human nature has changed and the polit political options before us have changed and and then we could talk about whether you know utopia is actually uh, something that we could create on Earth, but n none of that's happened. Well, what what actually has happened is that the United States and the Europeans have moved from uh, from a traditional defense, and I, I admit when I say traditional, 
I, I don't mean consistent on the part of everybody for the last 400 years, but let's say that there's been a, a, a very strong tradition of independent national states uh, for, for the last 400 years, certainly in, in the English-speaking world. And instead of defending that, um, American and European leaders have moved to a rhetoric of, uh, not just a, a rhetoric, but a, 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 a policy of uh, independence isn't really important anymore uh, because economically and in terms of security, we need uh, international institutions, we need international um, uh, decision making, and uh, and these national states are uh, slowly but surely going to be overcome and eliminated. That 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 is, I think, the dominant rhetoric. It's obviously much stronger among uh, intellectuals, you know, like let, let, let's say academics, whether American or European, are v- very largely committed to this. Uh, and But then the surprise is that, that uh, even if you, if you move into what used to be kind of like the moderate wing of the Democratic Party, uh, they're internationalists. And then you move over into the, uh, into the sort of um, uh, more libertarian wing of of the Republican Party. Now, I, I, I know it's a mixed bag, but there's an awful lot of people there who also talk in terms of uh, world order and, and they, they speak yeah. with uh, um, confidence, not about how we're going to lay down our swords, but rather how American might is going to become the, the enforcer, the, the policeman that's going to, um, uh, turn uh, to create a a, um, uh, a a rules rules-based international order if I'm getting the buzz phrase right that rules-based international wor- order is going to be enforced and who's going to enforce it well it's going it's going to be American might with a little bit of uh, help help from the Europeans and we've had examples of it right so so uh, the the overthrowing of uh, of regimes by invasion or by uh, aerial bombardment in uh, in Serbia, in Libya, in Iraq, uh, through diplomatic coercion in Egypt and in other places. This is a kind of a systematic policy of we're going to make the world better uh, using our values and our muscle. Okay, so that that's not laying down swords and plowshares. That's a uh, a version of traditional imperial theory. And and I'll I'll, I'll just add that that I, I don't think people make a very big s- secret about this. If you when 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 you read the 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 literature by think tankers and intellectuals and journalists and academics who are uh, um, sort of the brain trust for this way of approaching the world, they're, they're constantly referring to precedents from the, from the Roman Empire, from the British Empire, from the, the uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire. So there's like a com- comparative imperiology uh, that, uh, well, that, that's, the, that's the big new idea. I, I don't think this is a good idea. So and I, I think, yeah, go ahead. So in between that vision, Short of that vision of America as policeman, which I'm uh, also uh, not enthusiastic about, mainly for a lot of reasons. I think there are, we could spend another half hour on that. Let's, but let's not. But there's something short of that, which would be uh, this would be sorry, I would call the the libertarian vision, and you invoke it uh, when you talk about what you call a neutral state. Can't we just have nations that let people thrive according to their own desires? We will link with other nations through trade and possibly immigration, and uh, we'll all get richer through the division of labor and the Smithian uh, trade that will take place. It'll be a fanta- It's a fantastic world that we've seen an enormous improvement in standard of living for the poorest people in the world over the last 30, 40 years. It's been extraordinary, and um, that's, that's great. What, what, do you, what are, you, are you worried about that? 
Well, I'm actually kind of a fan of that. I mean, I, I, uh, I, w- I was sold on, uh, on, on the free market when I was in college, which is already, I'm embarrassed to say how many long time ago. <laughs> um, so it, as, as, as far as the, the general economic, uh, approach, uh, Hayek and, and Milton Friedman were my heroes and, and they still are. And I haven't, I haven't really moved from that. What I, what I don't buy is, and I, and I never did, even in college, is the idea that uh, that what the what the economic libertarians are describing is a a formula for uh, for how to order the world in general, or even for how to uh, order societies. Because ju- just because um, you can show. And 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 I, and I certainly believe this. Uh, just because you can show that uh, that giving uh, maximum f- freedom in the sphere of uh, of free enterprise, uh, which which allows uh, encourages private initiative, private initiative brings on uh, innovation and uh, originality that no planner could ever have come up with. Just because that works in economics doesn't mean that you have now described uh, what is necessary for uh, for a nation to survive uh, through time. And there are uh, I- important political theorists. And in, uh, and 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 by the way, I I, I would in- include the. Uh, 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 the Scottish School, uh, as as well as uh, the English common lawyers, the uh, from Fortescue to Burke and onward, the, the, these are these are theorists who are trying empirically to understand what it is that allows a state to be stable, uh, what 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 allows it to be stable, to endure, to be just. To be uh, to maintain uh, freedom, not only domestic freedom, freedom of individuals and limited government, but also freedom internationally. That is, freedom from being coerced by foreign powers that might not want you to live your life the way you want to live your life. Uh, that's a that's a complex of issues. Um, most many of which are not dealt with by uh, the libertarian thinkers at all. Or almost at all, uh, you can't you can't you can't derive a uh, a general theory of um, of what's needed for the uh, long term uh, persistence of a free nation, uh, such as you find in in um, uh, in Burke or in um, or, or or even even in John Stuart Mill. You you cannot derive these things from uh, the principles of uh, of liberal individualism. Well, I want to, let me take that in a different direction. Uh, I've been talking occasionally on the program recently about my dissatisfaction with economics in its most sterile form as seeking human satisfaction and through material well being, and I and I think. You know, material well-being is really important. Big fan of it, but it's only a small part of what makes us flourish as human beings. Gives us ultimate satisfaction. And it, that that thought reminds me of your critique of John Locke, which I'd like you to expound on. Um, what, what's wrong? What's missing? Give, give me Locke's vision of humanity and political order, and what's missing from it. And if you may want to tie that into what you just talked about. Sure, I I try in the book to um, to isolate a uh, a tradition which I'm I'm calling it the liberal tradition. If if you want to give it another name, then we can do that. We don't need to argue about the semantics. But I'm I'm calling it the liberal tradition. This is a tradition um, that that approaches uh, the political life of peoples. Um, 
not empirically, and not 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 by trying to say, all right, let 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 let's look at the at the history and experience of of nations and see what what works and what doesn't work, but rather uh, from a perspective that is is uh, later called rationalist. Rationalist means you begin with principles that look self-evident and you deduce from there. And um, uh, Locke is part of this rationalist tradition, which includes uh, Hobbes and then goes on to uh, Rousseau and Kant. It's a, it is a tradition which sees political theory as being something very much like mathematics – you begin with uh, with axioms that look self-evident, and then you can get to universal truths, just like they thought Euclid's geometry works. You can get to universal truths that then apply that they're that they're true and good for for all political uh, times and places for human beings in every single time and place in all of human history and around the globe. So I I have a problem with that in, that entire non-empirical approach to begin with, but but. It, in particular, if we take a look at what what did they do with it, um, Locke Locke begins the second treaties of government with a number of assertions. They're really axioms, like in a mathematical system. Uh, first, that uh, that uh, human beings can access uh, universal, eternal truths for all times and places. Uh, through individual reason alone, which he says teaches all mankind who will but, but consult it. Second, that all human beings are intrinsically perfectly free and perfectly equal, he says. And third, that it's only by the consent of the individual that they become members of of any kind of political society and, and thereby incur moral obligations. Now, these three axioms are the uh, the the basis for uh, for I, I I think for most of what today is referred to liberalism, both progressive liberalism and and what today is called classical liberalism. And I think that the the, the problem is that that these three axioms are arguably not true. Um, they certainly seem to uh, apply to be very useful and to reflect some kind of important truth when you use them as the the basis for uh, for uh, for a model of the market and and in fact all of uh, uh, economic theory later is constructed around these these axioms one way or another but they don't describe any existing uh, nation or state in the world. They they do describe certain existing economies. Obviously, it's a simplification, so so it it uh, uh, it, it gives you an abstracted description, but it's a pretty good description of a market. What it doesn't give you is a description of of uh, of other political institutions. It 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 can't describe the family and it can't describe the uh, uh, clans or tribes and it can't describe nations and it can't describe uh, imperial order. It, it, it can't do any of the things that you need in order – need for a political theory to be able to be intelligent. And this is an, an objection to Lockeanism that it, – it's just appeared over and over again. It uh, appeared already even before Locke was born <laughs> – in in uh, no seriously because this this is an old idea, uh, so uh, a great uh, a great political theorist and common lawyer John Selden was was already attacking this in the in the 1640s, and 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 then if you look at uh, uh, Hume and Smith and Adam Ferguson and uh, and and Burke. And all of them reject this. They they all they all say this can't be the basis. For our understanding of, of politics, it's it's just simply a fiction. Now, some of the, um, you know, some some of the people, some of my friends who, who read my book, they they reasonably object and they say, well, well, Yoram, that's that's 
that's true that uh, that the whole Lockean paradigm and framework is based on uh, questionable axioms of limited worth, and it, it it really can't possibly support liberalism, and that's why great thinkers like Mill and Hayek later they they throw out the uh, the Lockean basis for liberalism, and they they, they try to 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 come up with an empirical basis for it. But the problem is, first of all, that that Mill and uh, and Hayek didn't succeed in offering an alternative theory of of uh, how politics works. They didn't come and say, um, "Look." Um, this Lockean picture is completely or largely false. Let's uh, l- l- let me tell you what's true, and then build up from there. Instead, they they uh, work backwards, and they they say, "All right, well, look, the uh, the um, uh, liberal economics works. So, uh, w- w- what 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 is it that we can say about uh, about how how politics has to be on the basis of the fact that liberal economics works?" I, I don't. I don't think anybody has done what I think a, a minimally reasonable thing to do would be, which is to say uh, the Lockean axioms are false. Even the greatest liberal thinkers understand that they don't uh, – they're not adequate in order to uh, describe political reality. So what is a description that is adequate to describe political reality? That, that's what I try to do in, in my book, The Virtue of Nationalism, is I attempt to rely on, uh, on the, uh, empirical, uh, the I- empirical tradition of political theory um, and uh, uh, some on anth- anthropology and sociology where, where, where you see actual attempts to uh, describe human beings in – Political life, and the first thing you discover when, when you read empirical writers on political things, rather than than these Lockean rationalists uh, who, who who dominate political theory discourse, the first thing you discover is that they reject the claim that uh, human beings are uh, capable of attaining. Reliably attaining universal uh, universal political truths simply by applying individual reason that that's completely rejected. It's 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 ridiculed, in fact, and uh, and instead they look for uh, uh, human beings who have uh, historical experience uh, in of nations that are uh, successful that uh, that flourish. Uh, likewise, the the claim that political obligation arises exclusively through choice well i mean there's no there's no evidence for 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 that i mean I if like it to be so, so. <laughs> okay but that that's that's already a different that's already a different question yeah. if if you have a good empirical theory of of how do human beings what what is it that brings human beings to to, prov- to to take on obligation and co- uh, co- cohere that's as John Stuart Mill's word to, the, the, uh, to create cohesive families, tribes and nations. What is it that ca- what, what is it that causes that? How do, you, how do you encourage that? What's good about it? what's bad about it? Once you have a good theory of that, then you're perfectly free to come along and say, well look, I think that that a cohesive society uh, would be better off if uh, if people were treated as though they were perfectly free and perfectly equal. That's a completely different argument already. But that's not that's not the argument that the Lockean tradition is 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 making. People today, and I'm talking about like the you know the the average co- college student, whether you know, left or right or center. Uh, and, and this is why am I blaming college students? Their professors are, are, are no better and neither are the journalists or the politicians. In general, what we hear is I have a right to do X. 
I have a right to free speech. Let's say, and I'm a big fan of free speech. I love free speech. I I I, I think what's the the the, the moves the increase in calls to towards uh, restriction of free speech and the imposition of a uh, of a universal universal standards of what you're, you should be allowed to say. I, I think this is incredibly frightening and, 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 and terrible. But the assertion, I have a right to free speech, I, all you're doing is you're, you're repeating like, like um, uh, something that's deduced from these Lockean axioms. Human beings are born perfectly free and perfectly equal. Uh, that, that, that's just not true. In order to create a a nation, you know, this is just like, just like it's like people, you know, you, you need, you need a, at least a minimum government in order to make the free market work. I think most people understand that. The, the same thing is true for every other freedom. Freedoms only exist because there are uh, traditions that have been developed over centuries in places like England and the Netherlands and the United States, these are the places where these traditions were born. And if you want to understand what causes them to come into existence, what do you need to do to maintain them? What are the things that, that threaten them? You can't just be asserting, I have a right to this or I have a right to that. You have to actually know how this happened. And this entire empirical discussion of how does – what circumstances make it possible for – uh, a, a right of this kind to actually be able to to uh, to uh, to persist through time. I have a doctorate in political theory. I, I, I can tell you from experience, it it does it almost doesn't arise in in the training of people who are thinking about these subjects. Uh, that's very very strange for for a civilization that prides itself on uh, you know on on its science and its mm. empiricism. Uh, in in the field of political theory, we are almost entirely non empirical. We are not interested in how these things come to be and what we would actually have to do in order to maintain them. All we want to do is assert that we have a right to these things because it's like uh, self evident to us, and and then enforce. And that that's not going to end well. Let's talk about cohesiveness for a minute. Um, obviously, when a nation is threatened, cohesiveness is very important. Uh, people often face a threat. Nation needs sacrifices to preserve the sovereignty of the country and prevent uh, death and enslavement. Um, when I look at the United States today, I see a uh, incredible lack of cohesiveness, and the obvious – I think the obvious example of that is our um, uh, lack of respect for one another on different sides of the political divide, an issue we've talked about recently on the program. But I want to pick something a little different. We're tied into some of the issues that you raise in the book. So I'm going to just pick a handful of things that have changed in the last 50 years. Uh, I don't know if children still say the Pledge of Allegiance as school kids. Uh, we did. We had to memorize it. I have a feeling that's – either gone or changed, just to say one nation under God would seem to be uh, troubling to many people in America today. Um, July 4th, it's a picnic day. Uh, it's not a time to celebrate our independence or the sacrifices that other, others have made for the present. Uh, Memorial Day is a big sale day. Go to the mall, a little more picnicking. Um, you're in Israel, the contrast between Israel's Memorial Day in America is, is, is shocking. It's stark, uh, partly because so many people have died in Israel defending the country and people – almost everyone there is – knows of a close relative or, or a friend who's died. But here it's like, yeah, it's eh, – we pay lip service to it. We have a flyover for, for an NFL football game. You know, we'll honor the military that way maybe. Or, you know, we're, we'll talk about, quote, the sacrifices others have made. But we – we don't really – it's not part of our national dialogue anymore, our national vision. The flag, you know, it's not It's not doing so well. Um, and uh, again, a lot of people I think are, are – find the whole patriotism thing, which is a piece of nationalism, not the same thing, but a piece of it, find it offensive. Um, the rah-rah America, you know, the whole idea of making America great again. Whether you think it's 
needs to be made great or it wasn't or it's not great now or whether you think the person the wise can make it great but the whole idea that the jingoism of it offends it f- offends a lot of people uh I, we're a remarkably uncohesive country at least right now does that matter is it important i you know I, my dad's 88 it really bothers him that that people don't always stand for the flag and i'm thinking is that the biggest problem in America right now? It's not. I'm pretty sure about that. But is it a problem at all? What's important about all these devotions and loyalties and things that uh, that you talk about in the book? Well, look, it's not important at all if you don't care whether America is going to, con- to continue existing. You know, it, it, if if your view and and if you honestly believe this, if your view is, look, I. I don't. I don't owe future generations anything. All this, all of this, you know, uh, uh, Burkean stuff, which we, we we see in the the preamble to the American Constitution, ourselves and our posterity. If you don't, if if you don't think that you have an obligation to uh, to hand down the uh, the 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 country, the nation that you inherited. Uh, in an improved condition to your posterity, then none of those things matter at all. Then, then you can be a Lockean Adam and say, "I never agreed. I didn't consent to uh, to uh, any obligations having to do with the future generations. I didn't consent to pass down, you know, the the traditions of my forefathers. I apply reason, and I think that that the flag salute is the dumbest thing." I mean, I, I don't, but I'm saying one one could say that. I, I apply my reason, my individual reason to it. I think these traditions are 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 worthless, or worse than worthless. I think they're terrible. Okay, so if they if lead that, to they lead to self righteousness and and hatred of others who aren't like us and disdain for them. Right, well, we're, we're worse be than more that. Tolerant. It's, 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 Today, people immediately you you start having a conversation like this, and they'll they'll because the, their political spectrum is so impoverished through ignorance, they'll immediately go to fascism. Say, oh, that's a fascist thing. Yep, sure. You know what, what's a, you what's a flag? <laughs> what's a flag other than a rag on a stick? That's yep. fascist. Yep. Right. And 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 I, look, like I say, if you don't care about the question of empirically. Historically, realistically, what needs to be done in order to hand a nation down to future generations in good order with its traditions uh, intact, both the ones that you, uh, uh, that you love, like, uh, like uh, freedoms and limited governments, and the ones that you don't like as much, like the fly. If you don't care about that question, then a political, political theory as a subject is just not of interest to you. Right, what's of interest to you is uh, is uh, you know how how I personally can get the most yeah. out of life. What's, that, in, that's it, not, what's in it for me? Right. That's, that's not the, <laughs> so. That's not that's not the subject of political theory. Uh, and if people want to live like that, you know what? The, the, there's always been people like that in history, and there always will be. And I don't have any particular big resentment against them. My, is, my, it, my, is it at risk? My, is it at risk? I mean, wouldn't you argue? That wouldn't you wouldn't you agree that the American ethos today today twenty eighteen not seventeen seventy six the American ethos today is what's in it for me what what don't don't tread on me right There's a sort of parody of of libertarianism without any hope without any side notes of civil society which is my version my vision of the classical liberal ideal is well look look no, no, notice that notice that you, you brought it up that. There is a relationship between the uh, the Lockean worldview, which is what we teach. I mean, I, I, I when I was in high school, they uh, the, the 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 school rounded up all the you know the, the the sort of bright kind of students, bright honor students, and put us in a class called politics, and they taught us about politics. And th- this was in eleventh grade. And what do they teach us? They taught us that politics is uh, is is a big dispute between Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. Right? They pick three thinkers, all three of <laughs> which, all three of which wrote these mathematical books that accept these same, more or less the same exact 
uh, Lockean axioms as the starting point for politics and made it as though there was like a big argument among them. Okay, now that's when when you do that. And I'm not saying anybody did this on on purpose, right? It's not like the high school teacher it's sinister, yeah, knew better. It's not it's not sinister, but but it's not sinister. But the fact that it's not sinister doesn't mean that it's not stupid. What 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 happens when you do that? I mean, this is as effective a um, a, a a tool for indoctrination as any that have that have been devised. You you give a student three different thinkers. You tell the student what are the differences among them, what are the distinctions, and you completely ignore the shared premises so that the students never question them, ever. So when I was in college, it it was Rawls and Nozick. That was the – Right, it's the same thing. Rawls and Nozick. What are we missing from those two examples of – They're they're both Lockeans. What are we missing? We're missing – we're missing – well, it – in in my book, I I I make a very very specific uh, argument. I I argue that that human beings are um, by nature capable, uh, and when I say by nature, I, I I mean that this is something that appears in every human society at every scale, just about that I'm aware of. Human beings are capable of what I call mutual. Developing mutual loyalty. Mutual loyalty is uh, is another way of saying uh, uh, cohesion. And this mutual loyalty, I argue, that uh, is developed by children towards their their family members and and uh, the, the, their their parents and their brothers and sisters at, at a very small age. And this is not by the way, something that uh, prevents them from being able to be individuals. Because if you look, if you look at small children, they spend half their time fighting with one another and, and bickering for, you know, for position and place within their, you know, their little hierarchies. But the way mutual loyalty works is that whenever they are, uh, feel any kind of external threat, they immediately shift to seeing each other as a single unit. Okay, now this, and 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 then when the threat passes, they go back to bickering and and fighting. You don't. This is not something that uh, um, you you don't have to be kin in order to do this. You know, it's it's not it, it it's not it's not because of biological proximity. A husband and wife, their their relationship is adoptive. It's not it's not. You know, the, 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 they, they, they could be from the other side of the world. But once they've adopted one another, the same exact thing happens. They, they develop a relationship of mutual loyalty where they can bicker and fuss and fight terribly up until they have to deal with any kind of challenge. And as soon as they deal with some kind of challenge, then they start to treat each other as a single unit. Now, this, this characteristic of mutual loyalty is is a completely different phenomenon from from consent, right? because because uh, the 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 relationship that that um, that a brother has to his brother or a sister to his sister, her sister is um, is a and and this works just as well whether it's a biological sister or an adopted sister that. That relationship of mutual loyalty is is not something that has anything to do with consent. It continues to operate even if – even though nobody ever asked me if I want to be loyal to my brother. I was I, – I mean I didn't choose my brother. I didn't choose that relationship and still it exists. Now that, that, that mutual loyalty, that is the foundation of uh, – of that, that is the strongest force in all political, uh, all of political reality. I'm not saying there are no other forces. There is such a thing as uh, as individual sympathy, and there is such a thing as consent and choice. All these things exist, but by far the most powerful force always is mutual loyalty. And where you have um, a, a uh, a nation in which those mutual loyalties exist, and and let me emphasize, that doesn't mean that 
people don't compete and fight and even hate one another. It only means that that there are that when there is a perceived common threat, each one will be willing to sacrifice and give his or her life for the others. Okay, so where we have that, we have the capacity to do all sorts of things, like passing down um, traditions, some of which are extremely odd and extremely strange, like um, uh, the uh, the English developing a, a tradition that the king is going to be um, – is not going to have the right to enter the home of even a peasant because it's a private home. Okay, that that kind of tradition or uh, strong property traditions, strong uh, marriage traditions, like you, 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 you stay away from somebody else's wife or husband, those kinds of traditions, they are, they're not natural. It's not, it's not natural to stay away from somebody else's property when you when you want something. It's not natural to stay away from somebody else's wife. Those things are completely artificial, but because they're handed down as traditions within a society marked by mutual loyalty, people say, "Oh, well, you know, I really want to take that guy's uh, that that guy's motor scooter or or that woman's husband. I want to take him." But out of loyalty to the society that you live in, you you refrain. I'm not saying every single person obviously refrains all the time, but in general, what happens is that you don't need coercion to enforce these traditional rules. That you don't need despotism to do it. The way that the, that people obey the laws, pay their taxes, volunteer to serve in the military, even if it means death, the way that happens is because their loyalty to their society is stronger than their desire for individual self-preservation or property or, or individual consent or choice. So obviously you can do terrible things with that. You can, you can create all these you know, nightmare fascist societies that people are always talking about and that have really existed. But the thing is that a free society can only be built on mutual loyalties as well. So the America that we're looking at right now that I completely agree with you that as in, in which the mutual loyalties are, you know, to put it nicely, they're fraying. The, I mean, the, the truth is that, that they're on the ropes in a serious way. The disintegration of mutual loyalties means the disintegration of the basis on which our freedoms are built. Yeah, I'm, I'm – um, it's a set of issues and concerns I – I haven't thought about much, um, and they've come to the fore in the last few years, and um, I think a thoughtful person has to think about them. There is a presumption that things will always continue on the way they always have. Um, this is not true, <laughs> and <laughs> there is a desire to live in a world that is consent only rather than some feelings of obligation. Obligation is no fun, so – I, we all understand the natural human impulse to evade it uh, and only take the benefits without uh, providing any of the contributions. Um, and so, you know, I think I think these are deep issues. I'm, I'm just going to read something you wrote, which I thought was very provocative uh, related to this question of consent. You say, uh, and the project of raising children only continues to throw up ever new surprises over the decades, including hardship and pain that were scarcely imagined when first they entered into it. Yet this original decision cannot be revisited, giving the parents a chance to renew their consent based on an updated assessment. The ways the benefits of each child brings against the suffering endured, just the opposite. The parents' consent or lack thereof is irrelevant to their continuing responsibilities, and it is nothing like consent that motivates them as they persist in their efforts to raise their children to health and inheritance. End quote. And of course, this is true. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that uh, we often want to escape that consent. We want to evade our responsibilities. And I think that the challenge uh, – I'll say it in a funny way. I think in America, going back to the political issues you raised, we've just gotten out of the habit. You know, We're just not in the habit of making sacrifices. I think when we talk about the greatest generation, the people who died in World War II and who sacrificed either at home or on the front – 
Um, it's part of a recognition that we're a long way away from that. Uh, those days are over. They could come back. It would probably take a tragedy of enormous proportions to bring it back. But uh, I think we're in the middle of a great experiment right now where the things that created, the, as you say, the norms of, of freedom and, and other things are on the ropes, uh, not not being discussed. Um, so – I, you know, we'll see how we'll see how that plays out. I, I, I'd like you to say a little bit more, though, about what's scary about the imperial order, because I think in the book, I've been sort of—I um, have to confess—I've been sort of uh, naive about the implications of, say, the European Union or the World Trade Organization, and the people who were worried about national sovereignty when we joined the WTO. I thought that was kind of silly, but you. You raise a number of really important points, and I guess the part that really scares me is the potential for a global system of governance to impose tyranny more widely. I think that's the the biggest fear I have, say, about climate change, if there were some global solution that had to be enforced. Um, I'm open to the possibility that climate change is a scary thing. I'm, I'm agnostic. Or slightly skeptical of it, based on my reading of the of the data, uh, and I know listeners out there that makes some of you upset. I apologize for that. I I know they're really smart people who disagree with me. They're unfortunately are not really smart people who agree with me. Um, but we're putting that to the side. The, the reality of it that a lot of people want us to do something to impose a global solution on what is indeed a, a global problem, and uh, that concentration of power makes me nervous, uh, high, very nervous. Um, and so when I, look, when I look at the global urge, which I see among all of my left-leaning friends, um, and I, 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 I love them, I respect them, as you say, many of them, most of them are very well-intentioned, good-intentioned, people with good intentions. Uh, I, I don't always remember that there will be a sword um, – imposed by a central authority somewhere down the road. So talk a little bit about why these global – and I want to come back to the EU because, again, I think a lot of people think Brexit is – which is so obviously a bad decision. And I thought your point that the fact that people thought that was obviously a bad decision is obviously scary because maybe maybe there's – national sovereignty is important and maybe there are risks of – European Union that people are just simply going to ignore in this urge for this global utopia. So t- talk talk about why that's more than just, oh, it won't work so well, but actually scary. Well, I, I, I think Margaret Thatcher was, uh, w- was already quite clear about this in, uh, in, in the late eighties. And then, then she went on to write a book called, um, Statecraft, I think 2003, which was you know, almost universally reviled. But if, if you go back and read it, I think you'll see that it's in many ways prescient. I, people, I, th- I think many people um, who are lovers of, of uh, freedom, economic freedom especially, um, I, I, I think that they can trust that Thatcher is no um, – Thatcher is no no fool on these subjects, and uh, the description, her description of uh, the naivete of the British government going into the European Union, are genuinely frightening, because they, for some reason, didn't they, they didn't seem to understand that uh, that Britain, with a you know a tradition of of uh, uh, limited government. And uh, and uh, uh, property rights and citizens' rights uh, going back 800 years was giving control of its uh, of the regime governing it uh, the 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 legal and administrative regime governing Britain was handing it over to um, to other nations that don't have those traditions. And the uh, assurances that uh, that the British had received that 
uh, the purpose of these this kind of merging of ultimate legal and administrative authority, that the purpose of it was to um, uh, merely coordination, you know, to, uh, to, to, to make sure that, you know, that, that goods. It's like, uh, like using the, we're all going to use the metric system. That's a good thing. We're all going to use the metric system. This is fine. And she, and she says we, that, that, that this was simply, simply naive, that in fact, the moment that you, you uh, give uh, the, the, the Germans and the, and, and the French, the authority to make the decisions and in, in for, for the British, then you get decisions that are that are the kinds of ju- decisions that Germans or Frenchmen uh, w- would make. And the claim that you can just sit and reason with them is completely false. There's no, the, 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 they, the, the, they come from a, a different culture. They have different d- different ideas. And uh, in fact, what you've done is to take uh, the most venerable and most respected uh, free nation the, the 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 mother of all free nations uh uh and hand it over to a uh to institutions that don't believe in that freedom now the reason people don't um didn't at the time um simply uh jump to uh to embrace thatcher's view of this um i mean it was reviled and and attacked already then um, was because of uh, the uh, the pervasiveness of um, of economic models which convinced everyone that everybody's going to be richer if you um, uh, if you go through these uh, mergers of of national states. These are these are arguments that, uh, as I, as I write in the book, these are arguments that you find already with uh, with Mises and Hayek. Um, it, it's it's kind of a utopian vision that says, let's imagine that that all of Europe or the whole world could be like one big economic model, and let's pretend that there aren't any other uh, factors driving human politics. Uh, that, that that there are no uh, massive dis- d- distinctions between German traditions and English traditions, or that there are no uh, um, uh, group loyalties in play or uh, urges to, uh, to to conquer or to exploit going on. You're just going to pretend that all of those things don't exist. All of empirical human reality doesn't exist. And and then you have this utopian picture of everybody sitting and and reasoning together. The, the problem is that this simply never exists anywhere. And as the institution that you founded gains in prestige and power, then the people who run it simply uh, use their decision making capacity as the final decision maker to continue to um, to to expropriate more and more areas of authority. So, uh, of course, the Euro- European Union is, isn't some monstrous tyranny right now. The question is, what force is actually going to stop it? I mean, nothing. You know, what force would, is going to turn the European Union into a, uh, a, uh, an England style, a British style or American style um, uh, uh, inst- democracy, which 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 actually cares about protecting uh protecting the kinds of freedoms that you and I care about there's nothing on earth that could make that happen but what will happen and and you see this everywhere i think in 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 every institution you you, you put a group of people in charge you allow them to be committed to a certain uh, ideology and that ideology drives them to become ever more extreme if you don't want that to happen and we don't want that to happen well, there's an answer in political theory to how you prevent that from happening, but you're not going to like it. The answer we read in Vattel is that multiple centers of power in the international system are the only way to prevent any one nation from being able to dictate the law to all the other nations when it gains enough strength. The competition among centers of power, just like in in uh, in 
um, in in, uh, checks and balances theory and domestic politics, the same thing in international politics. Only by having very strong competing international powers do you have the possibility of maintaining freedom in the system. So notice Vettel does not claim that that the purpose of multipolarity is a stability or peace. He claims that the purpose is freedom. If you want to have freedom in the world, then you have to maintain multiple centers of power that can can prevent uh, one one elite from taking its whatever its ideas are and imposing them on the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I um, it's not a very good time for um, freedom, and I say that in, in, not in the normal way it would normally be interpreted. What I mean is that. That ethos, that idea that freedom is a value in and of itself is um, also on the ropes and in America of all places where it was, I think, most strongly felt. Um, we're losing that battle, uh, which reminds me, though, who, who else should you have read in that Hume, Rousseau? Um, oh, they didn't read you. Uh, sorry, you, 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 Rousseau, who you, was you, in it? You, you, Locke, you, you, Locke, Rousseau, and Mill were the three, or no? Locke, Rousseau. No, they, they, no, they, 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 they read oh, Hobbes, Hobbes, Locke, Hobbes and Locke, and Rousseau. Locke, and Rousseau. And I is, read, I read Rawls and Nozick. Who, who, who should have been added? But I don't know who Vitel is even. How do you spell it? Who is he? <laughs> Vitel, is he? <laughs> Emmer de Vatel, V A T T E L. He was a uh, 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 Swiss. 18th century uh, political theorist who is uh, one of the founders of what uh, of the international uh, law tradition. He, the, the American founders knew him very, very well. And um, who else should they have read? Um, I've uh, I, I've mentioned the common lawyers, uh, Coke and Selden and Hale, uh, John Fortescue is uh, is in praise of the laws of England. Is a is a pro freedom, pro England, pro common law, pro Bible uh, manifesto of political theory from the late 1400s, which you can read today. It's clear as a bell. It's beautiful. It, you don't have to struggle at all. It's like it's it it's like reading the the. Uh, um, the, the ideas that are going to create the United States 300 years later. But nobody knows it. Nobody, nobody reads it. We, we, we only read these rationalists who, who, who think politics is mathematics. So let's, let's close on a um, – I'm going to close on a Kantian note. I, I've recently been, <laughs> been reading some John Gray, the British philosopher, who blames um, Christianity – and the Enlightenment and Kant for creating this image of perpetual progress that through the application of reason, we get the scientific revolution, we get the creation of democracies, we get a rising standard of living. Uh, obviously, Steven Pinker is a exponent of this vision as well. It just We're just on this great path of, of – um, and John Gray would call it a messianic path of of, of future, soon to be uh, redemption and um, uh, a utopian um, Edenic delight. Uh, I suspect you're not in that group. So, <laughs> um, comment on that Kantian vision, which you do talk about in the book quite a bit, actually. This this optimism and um, talk about your own feelings of optimism or pessimism, given what we've talked about today. Look, I, I definitely believe that improvement is possible. Um, I, I, I think that the Anglo-American tradition, uh, uh, based on um, a kind of – an uh, a development of uh, uh, of Old Testament biblicism um, in a Christian key, obviously, uh, became um, a force for great improvement in the world on 
on on many fronts. Um, what's wrong with the uh, with the Enlightenment reading is that that improvement is not the result of Enlightenment thought. Uh, the the thinkers that we're talking about these these sort of quasi mathematician rationalists like Locke and Kant, their contribution to uh, to the freedoms, the science, the toleration that uh, that we see developing in uh, in uh, in the uh, Dutch and Anglo American traditions, uh, which which later was imitated and spread to the whole world, those thinkers contributed extremely little to that, and. Um, the the way we get to this uh, pretending that let's take the American founding I think is an excellent excellent example the, it, it's constantly said I mean I can't tell you how often I hear this that uh, that a, that a miracle took place in in uh, in the American in the American founding because for the first time in history reason was applied rather than traditionalism. Okay, I mean that, that's a wonderfully self-serving uh, way of crediting this fantastic achievement that was the American founding to uh, liberal rationalism. But uh, as I said before, if you pick up Fortescue from 300 years earlier, he's already saying that that uh, that th- the. Um, separation of powers and checks and balances and uh, due process of law and the jury trial and uh, uh, and uh, the the bicameral legislature he's already describing that 300 years before America and he's saying that this is already from time immemorial in Britain the the American Constitution was immensely successful for centuries because it was a adaptation, an adaptation and a continuation of the British Constitution, and the American founders knew this. I mean, just pick up John John Adams. He wrote three entire volumes uh, to defend the claim that the British Constitution uh, in 1787, that the British Consti- uh, he, he he published this in 1787, three entire volumes to defend the claim that the British Constitution is as close to perfection as any that's ever been on the face of the earth, and that the strength of the American Constitution is that it continues these British traditions on most of the key points. Now, who teaches that? Who understands that? So, I see, your question about my optimism, the answer is this. I can see in history that things can improve. But what I can't see is that that people are capable of crediting the improvements to the very long tradition traditional processes based on the Bible and based on religion and based on all these things that they, that that impose obligations they don't want to hear about. People do not want to credit the improvement to the actual processes that brought about the improvement. They don't want to read the books about it. They don't want to know about it. They want to believe that if you and I sit together, we could just, and think hard enough, we could just like kind of invent the American constitution ourselves because we have reason and, and we have reason and we have consent and we have freedom and that's all we need. And to get, so with regard to your worry that you expressed before with which I'm, very, very sympathetic. Your, your, your worry that that the belief in freedom is being lost. I, I, I see what you're talking about, and I'm worried about just that thing. But I, I, I want to put a to approach it from maybe a slightly different angle. The American founders, like their the the British common lawyers that that thought about the the tradition before them, understood. That that freedom is an artificial thing that grows out of a a particular religious and national tradition, and if you throw out the religious and national tradition, then you'll lose the freedom too. Americans had a reasonably solid understanding of this up until World War II. That that 
uh, freedom was not the opposite of the uh, Christian and American nationalist tradition. Freedom was a consequence of the Christian and, and, and American nationalist tradition. When you uh, falsely say, well, I want just the freedom, I think it can survive on its own, then you create a, 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 a new political system that not only never existed in history, but the, the evidence seems to be that it, that it doesn't work. And, and then anybody who sees that it's not working, for example, that, that uh, 40% of children are, 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 are born out of wedlock, that, that's a massive dysfunction. And they blame freedom for it. Or, 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 or that the the birth rate in the United States was is, is plummeted to to uh, the fertility rate to 1.76, and, and will continue to drop apparently until it reaches European levels. That's a, that's a massive dysfunction within within the United States, and it's too easy for people to say, "Look, that's because of freedom." But it's not really because of freedom. It's because freedom took the place that had had been reserved in the American political system for Christianity and, uh, and, and American nationalism and freedom, which, which was wonderful as one part of that, was, was then turned into the only one of the appropriate values. As soon as you do that, then you turn freedom into the enemy of the very things that gave rise to the freedom to begin with. Well, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Strikes me as not a good thing, but uh, either way, we're in the middle of an incredible experiment yeah. uh, of social right. change in a very short period of time. Um, and um, it's a very interesting time to be alive. Um, my guest today has been Yoram Hazoni. His book is The Virtue of Nationalism. Yoram, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. Thank you very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.